All right, we're doing this. I hit a button, you hit a button. Here we are. This is Jay Brown Yoga Talks podcast. My name is Jay Brown. If you're new to the show, let me welcome you. If you're returning, thank you for doing that. How are we feeling? Is it safe to ask? I have a fun and thought-provoking conversation to share with you today. I'm talking to Daniel Simpson. I'll tell you about that in just a bit. First, though, I really want to have a little bit of a check-in this week, if that's okay. If you're new, sometimes this happens. I like to do a little check-in. Some people like it, some people don't. If you're not into it, it's fine. You can skip ahead. But I don't know about anyone else. My week had some ominous signs, like there was some weird omens. In my gut, I was feeling like we have yet to really see the impact of these extended shutdowns. And I feel like I had my own personal examples that felt like omens, like bad omens. <laughs> and, and strangely enough, let me just say this first, before I take us into the darkness, that on an internal level, I'm actually doing okay, pretty good. In fact, the mouth pain I'm happy to report is better. I've been having really fruitful practice. Shout out to all the people listening who attend my live stream classes. I've got a group of people coming to my live stream classes right now that are really, I don't know, we've got like a sangha going via Zoom. And I'm just really grateful for those classes every week with y'all. And I know some of you listen to this. So if, you, if you're one of those people, thank you and shout out to you. So my practice has been doing great and I'm, my pain levels are all like way back to like what I would call the manageable levels. In fact, I would say I felt pretty good, but it was just in time for some disenchanting life curveballs. And it's not anything I can't handle, I don't think, but it just is those little things that happen in life that make you feel like things aren't right. And the first thing that happened is something that I have tried my whole adult life to avoid. My entire adult life, I've been trying to avoid this one thing. And it happened to me this week. I got a letter from the IRS saying that I owe them money. And you have to understand, I am what I would call ridiculously honest when it comes to like my taxes. More honest than I, I, I need to be, I think. But the reason I've always been that honest on my taxes is because my dad never was. My dad used to love to, to talk about and wear like a badge that he didn't pay taxes. And I remember when I got to be about, I don't know, 16 or so, and I saw a letter that came in the mail from the IRS saying that my dad owed money and really a threatening letter. And it freaked me out. And I was like worried. And I went to talk to my dad about it. And he, he said, oh, don't worry about it. They're not going to do anything. And I'll never forget. He said, listen, if you owe someone $10,000 and you don't have it to pay back, that, that's a problem for you. But if you owe someone $10 million and you don't have it to pay back, that's a problem for them. <laughs> and I just remember, even at the time, feeling like I didn't feel like that's a mindset that I would ever be comfortable with. Like, I don't ever want to get a letter in the mail saying I owe someone money. That feels to me like my house isn't in order and like someone's going to come after me or some shit emotionally, I've never been able to like distance myself from money or my business in a way where like, it's just business. And it's like, I don't, it's not personal. I don't care, whatever. Let them send letters or like, I just, I've always been like a straight shooter. 
And so that when this letter came in the mail, I couldn't believe it. And basically, in 2018, and longtime listeners will remember this. You see, 2017 is when I let go of the center and moved to Pennsylvania. 2018 was the first tax year I filed, my first year in Pennsylvania. And it was a really crazy time. You might remember, I was in a real life transition and... You know, I didn't have any money. And so I did my numbers myself that year, I know. And basically what happened was, is I took a net number and put it where I was supposed to put a gross number and then left off an expense. And it was a perfectly honest clerical error. I didn't try to like cheat the government. I have bank statements to substantiate what what I did. You know, I have nothing to hide but I got this letter and it could be a real problem because it might not matter really. Is there a person at the IRS who's going to review my case and see that, you know, I'm an honest guy who made an honest mistake and it's going to just all be fine. (laughs) I don't know. Is my, is my response going to get put on a list for, however many months, and then some point in the future, they're going to come back. Who knows? It just feels like the system isn't designed to work for people who don't have a lot of money. And we choose to make our taxes this complicated mess where we have to pay people to do it for us. And the truth is, if I had enough money, I would get myself some bulldog fucking lawyer who would just fucking make it go away or whatever. It's the mentality of our, of our system sometimes or the way that we treat each other. And nobody's even acting like we, we're in this middle of this pandemic. And you know, the other thing that happened this week that's just been tweaking me out is I've run into like some issues with my landlord at the studio space that I rent, which I can't believe because I've been in the studio space for two and a half years My rent has been on auto payment the entire time. We've never missed a payment or even come close to being late to a payment. And for the last two years, we got automatic um, lease renewal. You know, like they would send us the offer. It goes up every year, of course, but they would send us, you know, lease renewals because, you know, we're good tenants. And this year, at the beginning of the year when the pandemic hit, I reached out to them and I asked them if they would help me out. And I got some weird auto kind of email back that asked me for all this stuff, including bank statements and other shit, which I sent them. And then I never heard anything from them. And, you know, I just didn't have the energy to try to fight with them. And we made it work. And I paid full rent this entire year throughout the pandemic. I paid full rent. And we were hoping to have a conversation with them when it came time for the lease renewal. But what happened was we didn't get sent a lease renewal. Now, maybe it's a computer glitch because they've got their system set up again in a way that's ridiculously complicated and inefficient so you can never get a hold of anybody. They do that on purpose. And they didn't send us a lease renewal. They automatically switched us to month to month and increase the rent with no notice, which I'm not even sure is like legal. I don't know, but it just felt shitty. And then I reach out to the building manager and he doesn't know nothing about nothing. He's in the dark just as much as me. You'd think that being a tenant who pays their rent on time and never creates a problem for you and is pleasant when you see them in the hallways for two and a half years straight would count for something, but it doesn't. Why? Because what it's landlords and business and that's not people or something. So now, you know, we're looking to see what else is possible. It just, it's, everybody seems to be acting the way they, they are charging these rates for these empty spaces. <laughs> it's crazy. You'd think that like in these crisis times, we would behave in other ways, but it's just the fear and 
the ongoing assault on us is really, it's weighing heavy, my friends. It's weighing heavy. And there's more to say about it in terms of like pandemic stuff, but I'm going to, I'm going to leave it for now. And if you want to stick around on the other side, I had some other stuff happen this week with my daughters and like just trying to figure out what the fuck I'm doing in terms of life and this pandemic with no end in sight. So I don't want to get too far into that right now because I think that would take us too far afield from the conversation that you're going to get to hear in just a moment or two. But everything I've been talking about now in terms of the system has a lot to do with the first portion of today's conversation with Daniel Simpson. Because Daniel used to work for the New York Times and he's got like a whole story before yoga where he got a glimpse into our system in a way that a lot of people don't. And I couldn't help but ask him about it before we get to his book, The Truth of Yoga, where we talk about like where yoga comes from and like all the things that have been said about yoga that are not necessarily true. And then what are the things that are true about yoga? We had a great conversation about all that and I was really grateful to have it and I'm excited for you to hear it today. Real quick before we do, let me shout out to any of you who are currently holding down centers or maybe you're actually planning to open something up if you are still using MindBody online, or maybe you're still spending all that time with spreadsheets, doing admin yourself, and pulling your hair out, I want to suggest that you check out today's sponsor, KarmaSoft. That's right. You all know KarmaSoft. We've been talking about KarmaSoft for years, and they're still holding it down with those centers that are holding it down. I've been in touch with Rudy, and he is working hard to give options and to work with people on an individual level and help them through this. KarmaSoft is the software that I use when I had my center back in Brooklyn, as I was talking about earlier. And it's a company that I think that will help you through this. So if your back end systems aren't working so smooth, I think you would do yourself a favor to check out KarmaSoft. Go to karmasoftonline.com Also, let me mention that this episode is also brought to you in support by podcast premium subscribers like Charlie Chappelle and Lynn Pompeo. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, everyone who is choosing to be a premium subscriber. Not only do you get full access to the archives, but it is the best way to help support and sustain this show. It's a choose your rate. You can cancel at any time. If you don't have any money right now and you want to listen to some of those archive episodes, you just send us an email and we will give you a free account. But if you are in a position to help contribute, it makes a huge difference. You can find out about becoming a podcast premium subscriber Along with my other stuff, I was mentioning my live stream classes. I got four classes a week that I do live. If you can't make it live, you can watch them on the replay. I also got the weekly teacher's class. All of my stuff, podcast premium, all of my online stuff, everything can be found at jbrownyoga.com. Okay, y'all, I am going to touch base with you on the other side, but I don't want to hold us any longer. I think we should get to it. Let's listen to this conversation that I had with Daniel Simpson. Hello? Hey. How's it going, Jay? I'm doing good, Daniel. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, no, it's, it's fun to speak with you. Um, I, I've been reading through your book some in the months since you sent it to me. I haven't read it all. I've been kind of reading in sections, honestly, the way things are these days, but I, no I've, been, I've been reading, I've been reading through it some and uh, looking forward to talk to you. So, um, it's a pleasure to get to this moment. How are you? I'm well, thanks. Yeah. Another, another COVID groundhog day. I'm not quite sure what day of the week it is, but <laughs> surviving. I know, I know. And it, that you said that actually sort of brings me right to where I thought I was going to start with you because I had a bit of a debate in me as to where that should be. 
because, you know, a few months ago when you you emailed me and you sent me an advanced copy of your book, The Truth of Yoga, I I immediately recognized like, oh, this will be an interesting conversation because this book feels like an inquiry that I've been passionate about. You know, I think a lot of yoga teachers or just people who get into yoga, even when they have a experience with yoga, especially if it becomes sort of like a life pursuit, mm. you start to want to know, well, where did this all come from? You know? And, Absolutely. and your book starts with the premise of that much of what is said about yoga is misleading, which I think <laughs> is true. So Indeed. in any case, I, I resonated. I was like, Oh, I could talk to him about that. But then getting ready to talk to you today, like in the last day or two, I actually took a little time to sort of check into your background hmm. and, you know, saw about how you were at the times and you left the times and that for me, I felt like almost have to start there with you and then we'll get to the <laughs> yoga stuff. Yeah. The and, backstory. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah, And you know, I always, you you told me you listened to the show and I always right. want to know, well, why, why does somebody get interested in this stuff? You know? Um, and for me, the, it seems to me that we might have some similar motivations because, you know, I, I was living in New York in 2001 when 9-11 happened. Mm -hmm. And I had already kind of gotten into yoga because I just didn't want to have an office job, you know? It was already kind of like at that time, it was a counterculture move yeah. to get into yoga because nobody knew what it was yet. It was like still the early 90s. And you know, it was like me making this alternative lifestyle choice. And then, you know, 9-11 happened. And, you know, I've said this before in the show. It seems to like always get me in trouble every time I say it. <laughs> Go for but, it. But, you know, to this day, no one's ever been able to explain to me why World Trade Center Building 7 fell down when no planes hit it and nothing around the surrounding buildings were damaged. Like it just, to me, I've never heard anybody explain that to me. And I'm not suggesting any alternative theories because I don't know, you know, but I remember watching like Chris Matthews on MSNBC try to explain it away. Mm. And, you know, and then even just, in more recent times in terms of like the 2016 election and then this year's election, you know, I don't, I don't believe official narratives very often because I don't, I don't trust the sources that they're coming through. And so when I saw that you worked at the New York times and you worked with Judith Miller of all people. <laughs> yeah. She once tried to get me to stand up a story about Serbs selling weapons of mass destruction, delivery systems to Saddam Hussein. It was, it was a little far fetched. <laughs> I mean, but that's right to the heart of the what you called, <clears throat> and I'm quoting you, uh -uh. The, US, <laughs> the U.S. propaganda system. Well, and indeed, you, yeah. I mean, I'm quoting Noam Chomsky. You know, there's, there's, there's a lot of people whose ideas I was, I guess, informed by once I, you know, I suppose, saw through <laughs> some of what, you know, people don't like to talk about. And that's not to suggest that all journalists are lying all the time. I mean, the problem is that you know, once you get skeptical, you can open your mind so much that you know, the brain falls out. <laughs> and uh, a lot of that has happened this year, I've seen, around skepticism about the media. I mean, obviously, you referred to the 2016 election here also in the UK around uh, the decision to leave the European Union. Um, a lot of people became disillusioned with the way that the media was reporting on the world that just didn't reflect the reality that they lived in and uh, were framing things in such a way that they could no longer trust what they heard, but then ran to another extreme. And, you know, I used to work in the media. I know a lot of good people who still do. And there are, you know, it's like science. <laughs> There's a methodology for finding things out and asking skeptical questions. It's not perfect, but it exists. And if we can learn to you know, assess what it tells us critically, then we learn from it. But, you know, if we take it as gospel truth, then we're going to get led up the garden path for sure. I guess that's true. And, and knowing how to discern it and not just, you know, even right now with the pandemic, I have friends who it just seems like there's a real stoking of fear in a way that's not even constructive. It's not even about being informed and making good decisions so that we get through it. 
No, indeed. I think you've, you know, you've hit a thing on the head with the pandemic. I mean, there's, there's another tendency that's you know, become ever more <laughs> sort of widespread. I heard your conversation with Carol Horton about some of these ideas. You know, p- people like to tell other people what to do. People like to feel righteous that you know, they've figured stuff out and they've identified the people who haven't. And that just gets ever more entrenched and nobody listens to each other. So you know, there's, there's, there's very little constructive conversation that can start to happen once 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 things back into that kind of dynamic so i mean obviously everybody's got strong opinions <laughs> and uh, strong reasons for for, for 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 feeling that you know theirs are more valid than other people's and you know and i get that but uh somehow communication on that level is is just not very constructive and so i think it tends to polarize the discussion ever further and and we, you know we've seen the symptoms of that yeah, I guess in college I read Chomsky and about manufactured consent and mm. and I guess but it's when it actually is happening to actually just sort of call it for what it is is not easy to do. And 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 it seems like these well, days I almost like I like have to watch these like YouTube people to try to get any other kind of narratives or follow people on their substract like Matt Taibbi or whoever, you know, like to try well, to, yeah, to try to get some kind of what I would consider real reporting or something. Well, that's the challenge, and you know, I'm glad you mentioned Matt. You know, he's he's a guy I've respected for for a very long time. Um, you know, he started out as a <laughs> fairly scurrilous satirical writer in Moscow, and I used to occasionally <laughs> read The Exile. I went and visited a mate of mine who was a correspondent in Moscow back in the late '90s, and uh, you know, it was all good fun. But uh, he was a serious guy, and <laughs> this is horrendous. I, mean, I don't know why I'm mentioning this. But <laughs> here we go. Um, he once uh, wrote this story about um, in a, a stunt they pulled on the New York Times Moscow bureau chief where they, 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 they basically stuck a cream pie in his face, uh, which was <laughs> impregnated with horse sperm. I think the headline was Hack <laughs> Eats Horse Sperm Surprise. And it was because they deemed him the most credulous of all of the, uh, the Western foreign correspondents in Moscow at that time. Um, and reading this story, I mean, it sounds like frat boy humor, but um, actually he you know, built into there this, this really intelligent, you know, constructive critique of what was wrong with the New York Times' reporting out of Russia. And at that time, the New York Times was, was hugely into Vladimir Putin. Um, I think he used the phrase blowjob profile, if I remember rightly. <laughs> and, um, you know, this was all in keeping with Western business priorities. And he explained all this and he was quoting from fairness and accuracy in reporting. And, you know, I just thought hats off to the guy. This is, you know, if, if Hunter Thompson was around now doing things, you know, rather than <laughs> slowly pickling himself as he was by that stage, then, then that's what he'd be doing. And yeah. uh, I guess, you know, I, I wanted to be doing that myself. And instead, you know, I was, I was, was sort of towing the line being, you know, I guess a good little boy in those days trying to get ahead in my career. And then this, uh, this stuff happened after 9-11 and it was unignorable. And I think a lot of journalists, you know, they, they would read stuff like Matt Taibbi or, yeah, characters like John Pilger or Robert Fisk, uh, who you know, who've, who've sort of been very much independent voices while still actually doing the job of reporting. Um, although in you know, later years, they both they both just became a bit more, uh, I guess, stuck in their opinions. Um, but mm-hmm. still, you know, Fisk in particular went out on the front line all the time, and um, you know, journalists either you know disdained it and said these people are arrogant, full of themselves, or or they thought, yeah, that's wonderful, and and that's that's what I do, <laughs> except they went about a very different project. Because in the end, it comes down to, you know, are you going to be skeptical of sources of power? And uh, the job of the journalist is, in theory, to hold the you know, power structure to account. But the power structure doesn't much like that. So it, uh, it tends to send out signals that say, oi, back off when, you, when you're getting a bit too close for comfort. And that's what happened after 9-11. I mean, the New York Times you know, is said to be a liberal publication, but it bent over backwards to prove to the Bush administration that it wasn't that liberal, <laughs> that it, it understood terrorism and it understood difficult choices and, you know, that stuff from intelligence sources wouldn't necessarily be revealed, but we could take it on good authority that it was correct. And, you know, all that was, was insane, obviously. And there were lots of smart people who were having to convince themselves that it wasn't. And uh, watching them do that just blew my mind. Uh, I couldn't, couldn't take it seriously after that, you know? See that last part, the smart people convincing themselves that everything wasn't, <laughs> is that, I guess that, I guess the question in my mind, is there something more nefarious or is it like you said, just like 
trying to bend with political winds. It's ego, I think, really, Jay. It's a mixture of ego and, you know, everybody wanting to pay their bills. You know, you've got a family yeah. to raise. You, you know, you've got, you've got a mortgage to pay off. You, you want a nice, safe job. Um, so you tell yourself what a crusader you are, but, you know, when your job's sort of technically on the line, if you go too far you know, out of line, then, then obviously certain choices get made. And I don't really want to judge people for that. But at, at the time, it just made me angry because they wouldn't talk about it and they in fact, told me I was cynical or, or in some ways, you know, a conspiracy theorist. <laughs> right. Uh, but um, I think that's the problem, though, because, coming back to your original point, um, be, be, because not many people who are in that position want to talk about this stuff publicly, um, one is left with little alternative, um, unless you're lucky enough to happen on a voice like Matt, who's, you know, a journalist with integrity, uh, then, you know, there's, there's a whole world of, 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 you know, rabbit warrens you can disappear down now on the internet. I mean, I remember after 9-11, there was already quite a lot of it going, but those were the days before YouTube, whereas now you can just kick back, watch endless YouTube videos and think you know stuff, and they're very well put together, and they're very persuasive, and they're using exactly the same tricks as uh, other propagandists that people are supposedly running away from. And I find it depressing that the answer to propaganda is often more propaganda very hard to know how to fight <laughs> yeah. it by other means. But, uh, but I don't that, think that's the solution, unfortunately. Yeah, but that's exactly the point. It does feel like it's harder to know what information to trust. And, you know, these days, the people I'm referring to aren't like, like made videos like that. They're people who cite sources and, you know, are just more independent, independent media, essentially, because they don't feel beholden in any way. You know, even just recently is like a more current thing, you know, there's this guy, Jimmy Dore on YouTube. I don't know if you know Jimmy Dore, but he's a controversial figure. But mm -hmm. he just put forth this idea that, you know, these progressives in our, in our Congress could use their leverage to withhold their votes to Nancy, for Nancy Pelosi to get Medicare for all voted for, which is mm -hmm. a big issue here. It's like there, there is a way for the progressive caucus, AOC and the progressive caucus, to try to use the do what politics does to try to get their vote on the floor, even if it doesn't get voted for, you know? And in a way, like, that is such a, like, a legitimate news story that you will not see on MSNBC, CNN, even Fox News anywhere. No, indeed. But um, some, like, ex-comedian pot smoker on YouTube, <laughs> essentially... <laughs> Is putting forth a legit, and you know they're having to respond to it on Twitter some now, and there are some politicians who've responded to it. But it, to me, that's incredible. Like the news sources are supposed to be the places that would be like reporting such things. Sure, but then this isn't new. I mean, you know, people used to say that about Comedy Central back in you know fifteen years ago. Um, that, that, that yeah, and, and people like Stephen Colbert were, were doing a better job of taking ta taking the Mickey out of reporters and, and revealing the truth that way than the reporters are able to do themselves. I mean, you're right. It's it, the mainstream media is a mess, and I think there's a phrase for it that became popularized, I guess, by people like fairness and accuracy in reporting. It's the corporate media. It's in the business of profit. And so, you know, MSNBC has got to leverage an audience to, 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 to make advertising money. And that gets ever more contested these days as audience splinter off into all sorts of, you know, internet bubbles. Um, so anything that they can do to, 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 to try and pin it all down, which usually means whipping up a story that people want to hear. And that's, that's just become the way of doing it. So that's, that's now echoed what Fox News was doing. Um, and that's, I guess, you know, I think, I suppose, the start of the 2000s, getting radicalized, quitting my job, you know, basically going down a little pot smoking rabbit hole of my own. Um, I, I had the idea that that was the way to fight this propaganda with, 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 with stronger propaganda. And I've come to realize that that doesn't seem to work. It just, it actually removes the possibility of people having faith in, in, in you know, in, in anything, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, I mean, there are more credible voices out there, but no one's perfect. Um, everyone's got an agenda. We're all human beings. As soon as you arrange facts into some kind of narrative, you've left some out. Uh, whichever sources you cite, you've, not, you've neglected others. Um, well, we can't get away from that. So I think transparency is important. So people who are prepared to also admit that they're wrong, and that's something I like about Mike Taibbi. He, he sometimes says, I, I got it wrong. And uh, there aren't many journalists who do that. I mean, he's, he's quite an opinionated guy, so for him to, him to do that publicly is, is quite something. Um, I sometimes think Glenn Greenwald could uh, learn a trick or two from Matt in that respect. Oh, interesting. I mean, I like something, but I could see what you're saying. That is a real tell, though, right? Like the ability to... 
humility in the end. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Know, that's, and I suppose that's that's why I turned to yoga to sort of bring, bring well, us a little bit back on. Topic. No, but exactly. <laughs> I was going to go yeah. right there. Thank you. But the, my point that I was going to make is that you were faced with this moment. You told us. I mean, I guess not everybody who works at the Times gets asked to like drum up some story about Serbs, you know, like <laughs> that's a pretty, you know, encapsulated, uh, extreme even kind of experience of that kind of situation that some reporters might face. Well, and even so, I mean, I think most people find a way to make it go away and perhaps I would have done, but you know, I, before that for the preceding six months been in a really awkward position, um, you know, without getting into the weeds of Balkan politics and, you know, the, the history of the last 25 years, um, yeah, there were wars that led to the breakup of Yugoslavia. Um, it's basically uh, agreed, uh, although Serbs don't like to hear it, that uh, Serbian aggression had a lot to do both with the way those wars panned out and the severity of, 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 of the suffering. But you know, they weren't the only aggressors and there were war crimes committed on all sides. Um, however, the problem is that because they sort of initiated this thing and, and lit the powder keg, um, yeah, the world's had it in for them to a certain extent. They had sanctions that were still in force when I was living in Belgrade, you know, for at least two, three years after the, the, the war over Kosovo. Um, and so, you know, they were, they were pretty prickly about the idea that some you know, outsider who didn't really have that much of an idea of the ins and outs of the you know, complicated nuances of everything would come in and do what I was asked to do, which is basically say to Serbs, hey, have you realized you're all war criminals yet and decided to say sorry? <laughs> um, which is all based on this idea that's what the Germans had done after World War II and, you know, a mature democratic society should do that, you know, get to go through some bout of hand-wringing in public and admit they were all wrong. Um, and instead, these kids were saying, well, we were protesting again. I mean, these were the people I was hanging out with in bars. <laughs> so they, they would say, we, yeah, we, we didn't like this stuff. Like, you presumably don't like this war that's about to happen in Iraq, but, you know, what are you doing to stop that? How are you going to stop it? And, and it just, you know, my, that really, again, blew my mind. It probably did it didn't help again i was smoking a lot of dope but uh, you know i think it did help it, it helped it helped yeah no well. that actually yeah. i'm gonna suggest that my, the cannabis might have helped my friend like in terms of the reefer and go hang no, on a minute you know why i say that is like for me i'm a cannabis user so i'm totally biased but like i i've always found that my experience of that substance is that it it does sometimes give me a little bit of a mind space where i have different perspective or I just remember even at a younger age, like looking at my friends and being like, everybody's so fake or whatever. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> there, there was like, you know, there's a certain thing well, that yeah, sometimes the can the happen. The and the there's the a downside. Yeah, of course it can do other things that aren't helpful also. Well, it, but it, it, it also reveals to us that we're fake, which uh, can be a that's little true. Exactly. And that's where the paranoia kicks in. So you smoke a bit more and then, you know, you're, you're in a cycle. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're willing to take that on or you get into yoga or whatever. But you see, that's, that really does bring us to the yoga because the reason I wanted to talk all about that because we could we could continue down that road, I'm sure, for much longer in terms of mm -hmm. like how messed up the media is or geopolitics. But I think for me, as I said, it started out as, oh, I don't want an office job. But then it was, you know, there's this so much injustice and entrenched power structures, and I feel so small in the face of all that and helpless in the face of all that. And it's like to take all that in, like, as you said, you, you're, and I've heard you talk, you got pretty fucked up too. I got fucked up too. <laughs> like it'll fuck you up. Right. And for sure. me, yoga was the vehicle to find some other sense of self or some other way to live where I didn't feel so subject by that. Well, I would agree with you, Jay. Yeah. I mean, I, when I say I got fucked up, I got fucked up in all sorts of ways. I, you know, I, I basically smoked myself mad at one point. I stayed awake for days, you know, convinced I was going to write this uh, diatribe against the, the, the modern mass media and, uh, you know, I was going to emulate Jack Kerouac and do it on one typewriter roll. And, uh, you know, all I did was just carry on smoking and the, 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 the writing was happening in my head. It wasn't, wasn't actually being typed <laughs> into my laptop. It wasn't actualizing the onto the typewriter. By, by the end, I was lying on the couch with uh, Dr. Dre's 2001 on auto loop, just convincing myself <laughs> I was some gangster rapper and actually the, the neocons with attitude had staged it. It was a whole horrendous story. I mean, it, <laughs> I wrote about this in the previous book, but um, so I, you know, I really had to get grounded. Is all I'm really trying to say. And uh, the way in which I'd actually dealt with my frustrations, with my anger, with my 
I guess politicization was was to get really stoned and get into Balkan black comedy and think you know it's all hilarious um, sort of energy of uh, I don't know if you've seen sort of films like Black Cat White Cat um, you know this this crazed energy of Balkan madness it's the only way to cope in a way um, and I just needed to sit still with myself and I couldn't do it I was uh, you know I was 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 really uncomfortable in my own skin until I started the yoga practice and I dabbled in yoga before that I'd been to India quite a bit um, as to be honest <laughs> where I got into smoking a load of hash I mm-hmm. became deluded in the idea of thinking that you know all these sadhus who I was sitting around fires with chain smoking chillums were, were 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 somehow through dope smoking getting enlightened because it brought a sense of clarity and uh, and spaciousness and ease and uh, all those things were lovely so uh, I got a little bit too into that and uh, <laughs> had to find a way to find those things by other means and go into a yoga class and uh, you know doing pretty you know sort of modern postural yoga redux I mean I walked into an Iyengar class and, and you know, having to focus on all these intricate details of where to put bits of my body it just it, there wasn't so much time to be lost in my mind there wasn't so much uh, discomfort in my own body because I was focused on very specific discomfort or very specific instructions and and, and I just found that liberating it, it made a bit of space suddenly I, I didn't have to get high to find that and I was reading something that you'd written about yoga classes that you've been in in India was your first class in India or was it in I did a bit of, well, I mean, I, I did a bit of, uh, of yoga in India Ooh, back in the late 1990s. I, I went to some meditation retreats. Um, I bought light on yoga in Connaught Place in Delhi and basically left it in my rucksack while getting stoned and going trekking. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I dabbled a little bit. But my first class was in Bristol in the UK. And uh, it was just by chance, an Iyengar class. I didn't really know. I mean, I'd bought light on yoga by Mr. Iyengar, but it was only when I went into the room and saw those photos on the wall that I put two and two together. I'd, I'd kind of forgotten about it in the meantime. It was just suggested to me as that'll that'll, that'll help you deal with your anxiety and depression. Um, so yeah, it was it was it was pure chance. Then after that, I, I travelled around the world a lot for work, and wherever I went, I would go to Iyengar classes because it had become this methodology that was familiar. I'd sometimes even go in a foreign language. I couldn't couldn't tell what you know, endless blizzard of detail they were trying to throw at me, but I was so familiar with it by then that I could guess. Um, and uh, yeah, then I ended up spending a lot of time in India with a particular Iyengar teacher based in Rishikesh, uh, a Swiss German woman who, who married an Indian sadhu and uh, set up shop there. And um, so she's been there thirty odd years, I think. Now is that the class I was reading about where it was pretty Quite hardcore possibly. and they were like <laughs> making an example of you in headstand and stuff? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, to be honest, I hammed that up a little bit because I was uh, I was writing an essay for for an academic paper which was requiring me to show the difference between an insider and an outsider perspective on things. So I was trying to show, you know, as a sort of anthropological project, what people might make of that if they'd come into the room with no knowledge. I was a very willing participant in that process, and you know, didn't didn't really hurt me too much. But I guess looking back in hindsight, having I guess stepped away from the Iyengar world in the last uh, half dozen years or so. Um, I, but I, I don't I think it was exaggerated. I, but <laughs> it I don't think exaggerated. No, that's I guess what I was going to say. I don't play, think it was. I've, I've been in enough <laughs> younger class. I younger classes. I keep pronouncing it wrong. I get emails every time. It's I younger, not e younger. I am told. Every time well, I, I mean, anger is son, he, so he makes jokes about it being I anger yoga, and you know, there's a lot, lot, lot <laughs> well, of that's anger a good way to remember. It. That's the way to remember it, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, but you know the descriptions. I mean, I know, I know, as someone who writes, you can just through the way that you choose your words mm-hmm. make things certain, color them in certain ways. But I didn't think it was inaccurate at all. It, it, it certainly was the methodology. You know, and even the like kind of like pedagogy instruction style of kind of like analyzing someone's pose and the use of props to like align it. Mm. And a lot of people these days, and you know, it's interesting to see that particular way of working as almost a, a form of abuse. I mean, I hear you. Yeah, uh, I, I, I've, 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 I've seen it in action, and um, I, you know, I don't know if it's necessarily abuse as such. I, there's a definite bullying tendency that uh, is rife among some Iyengar yoga teachers, and not all by any means. Um, but they, they learned it from the Iyengar family. Um, there was, there was a tone set, particularly by Iyengar's daughter, who was you know, fierce task mistress. 
Um, and uh, you know, when I went to study in Pune with them, that was all revealed to me. It was it was very hard to unsee that in the same way that it was hard to unsee what I saw at the New York Times. And I guess I care about the truth. I mean, I've called my book The Truth of Yoga, and that's, mm-hmm. that's, that's what I'm interested in. Is you know. Uh, looking in various ways through my limited means as a, as a flawed human being for yeah, what feels true. And um, there was something about the method in the end that didn't feel so uh, yeah, helpful, I suppose, and, and that people, again, didn't really want to discuss. I mean, I remember Gita Iyengar shouting at a room full of 100 people that you know, they, they, they were responsible for her various diseases because they you know, kept doing things wrong and she had to shout at them all day. <laughs> Just like, what? Hmm. And, and tried to discuss that with some of the other students. And there was really only one guy who was, who, who, who was up for analysing it. Most others pretended they hadn't seen anything. And I just found that really weird. Um, See, just like the smart people who are having to find themselves a reason to think there was fine what was happening in the media. It's a similar phenomenon, sure, right? Yeah, you know, we, 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 we tend as human beings to like being in groups. And uh, it's very difficult to go against the grain in an in-group. Um, and, you know, we see that all over the place, even today with people who are you know, dedicated to busting yoga cults. <laughs> they got their own cult thing going on, too. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's you know it's very difficult to point these things out. People don't want to see them, so it's you know it's 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 it's, it's a human trait, unfortunately. I think. I think so, and I had a similar response as I think you did, which is okay. Well, let me see if I can figure out why I'm into yoga then, because there's something about yoga still, even though exactly. you, even exactly. even when you observe these like misgivings of the lineage traditions and i i just recorded a conversation with krishna das that'll probably come out before uh, this you know and he had a guru he had neem kuruli baba you know what i mean like that generation went and met pe- these pe- beings or people who served a certain role and i never had that you know like i didn't have that direct experience of someone like that necessarily and so for me, it became like, all right, well, let me see where does yoga come from and where did it all start? And I did not pursue it as in depth as you did in terms of like research and academic vigor. You know, I was just trying to find um, sources that I could relate to because I'm not so academically minded, like things that I was able to digest. And I mean, over the years, I think that's gotten more mature um, but I certainly was able to digest your book. Felt like reporting. <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear it, Jay. Because that's, I mean, like you, I've, I've, I found it very difficult to find those sorts of books when I started asking my own questions. And I mean, that began pretty early. Uh, I spent about 10 years dabbling in Iyengar yoga. And throughout that time, I was reading Mr. Iyengar's books and, and, and you know, feeling a little bit unsure how it all fitted together. Even that was very dense. Um, but then, you know, whenever I turned to the, the, the sort of shelf in the bookshop with, with yoga books, it was often all mixed up with, with new age fluffy stuff, for, right. for want of a better way of putting it, that, that did, did, didn't ring true to me either. And then, you know, over the years, I became more aware of, of, of yoga scholarship. And uh, some of that was fascinating, but it was, you know, it took a lot of, lot of reading and digesting. And I just wanted somebody to sit down and explain in you know, straightforward words of one syllable how everything fitted together. And, and so in the end, I tried to write the book that I wish I'd been able to read when I started out and uh, to use my journalistic skills to, to put it all in, you know, like 500 word news stories. I, here it is, you know, bit by bit, hundred aspects of what makes yoga yoga. And, you know, we don't have to implement all of them, but these are the stories that have been woven together in different ways in, in the various you know, lineage traditions of, of yoga practice. Well, that's the thing. Then this is my compliment to you and why I do recommend people check out your book is that as someone who has whatever written in whatever capacity I have, not as a reporter, but in other ways, I know what it is to try to like in 5,000 words, write about what the Vedas say. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> you know like that's yeah. not an easy task to do because there's always going to be some, some like you said some part that's missed but to try to like find some kind of sum up for it absolutely I, I mean this is a method that i was trained in i suppose you know i was originally a news agency reporter working for reuters and um you know those those newswire stories they're, they're, they're the things that get read out when there's breaking news on cable tv you know, no, no one's everywhere, but 
Reuters has a bureau in every country on Earth. So let's say there's an earthquake or a mass shooting somewhere else in the world. It's this Reuters story that gets ripped off, but you never know how many lines they're going to read. So somehow you've got to condense the essence of the story into the first sentence. And then if people read onwards from there, it's sort of all got to unfold. And they call this in journalism training school, the inverted pyramid. So, you know, you go down to the, the pyramid upside down, you're going down to the peak. And if you bother to make it down that far, it's all details. But, you know, in the very first line, you've got to somehow get everything there. So I guess, you know, that training served me well. It's, it's, it's a good way of you know, trying to get the essence of something across, even if in the end, you know, you're going to leave out a lot of information. And, um, you know, I, I, I hope that's, that's enabled me to do justice to these topics, despite in the end leaving a lot out. <laughs> well, with that preface, there are some of these topics that I thought I might probe you about because, frankly, there's just there's things that I've said as a teacher over the years, and I never and I know some of them to be true, <laughs> and some things are conjecture, and I always present them as conjecture. I never present anything I'm saying as like authoritative or definitive. I'm always saying like this is just what my inquiry points to and these are my thoughts about it like i don't i don't claim to know but i i'm trying to glean in whatever way i can about these things and you know when i looked to well where's the beginning you know there's the carving the seals uh, that supposedly georg forstein said go back to stone age shamanism and pyramid texts Yes, yes. And indeed. I know that's debated. Like there's no there's no hard evidence to prove that. Right? Exactly, yeah. I mean that's that's the basis on which people have said for you know, at least a hundred years now, um, that well, not quite a hundred, it was nineteen twenties, thirties that the idea really firmed up. But um it's uh the the uh yeah, the concept that yoga is five thousand years old going back to the discovery of some artifacts that are you know, really very, very small pieces of stone that have a function that nobody really understands, that show an image that's very hard to decipher, that has some sort of hieroglyphs on it that nobody can read. Um, and after that, you've got to wait at least uh, two and a half thousand years until you get the first definition in a text of a, a thing called yoga that's recognizable in the terms that we think of as yoga. Um, so really to assume backwards into the past based on later definitions that things are there in that image um, it's just to read history the wrong way around, unfortunately. I mean, we can't prove that that's not true, but we also certainly can't say with any degree of certainty that it is. And that's the problem often. People people like to make assertions based on rather flimsy evidence. Right. I mean, but we do know that there were things that happened in that 2,500 years there. Is that... In that time period, can we say that the Vedas happen in that time period? Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, the Vedas, this is all contested, of course, by some people in India who, you know, the the Vedas are said to be timeless and and to have no human author. They are a sacred text that's sort of channeled rather than brought into being at a particular place and date. Um, But scholars have got a fairly good handle on this stuff. And, you know, between about three and a half thousand years ago and 3,000 years ago, the the four main Vedic collections of hymns took shape. And, you know, they had a very specific function. And and it's different to the function of yoga practice. In fact, the two are almost unrelated in some ways. Uh, The ritual of the Vedas was about asking the gods for specific things, you know, as benefits here right now in this world. And, yeah, the, the, the whole idea of yoga practice was that uh, asking for things and outcomes and <laughs> uh, the whole the whole the whole activity of humans in in, in the world was the source of suffering. And um, so there's, there's there's a whole idea about action and its outcome and its function that's been turned on its head. Uh, the Vedic ritual saying it's it's totally to be encouraged. The the path of action is is to beseech people to provide. Uh, Whereas the path of yoga was, which is not you know exclusive to yoga, it's there in Buddhism and Jainism. It's, it's to say that to act is to incur you know, imprints on the mind that condition us into further actions. It's a cycle of suffering and endless but, but, rebirth. But wait, 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 wait because there's no that, rebirth in the Vedas. But that that <laughs> assertion about yoga being that act of suffering or whatever that leads to suffering isn't that like just one? Isn't that a classical yoga dualistic kind of Patanjali way of looking at yoga? But aren't there other like non dual ideas about yoga that would be more in line with like what you're describing the Vedas were more about, which weren't about like individual salvation so much. 
Um, Could you well, make a case for that? But it would be an ahistorical case. That's the problem. These these philosophies of, of non-duality really don't get articulated until quite a bit later. Um, right. You know, first Advaita Vedanta and also the non-dual uh, you know, tantric traditions. Uh, and then from there, you know, becoming so interwoven that you know, this is really the basis of, of modern Hinduism. If you are hearing this message, then you're listening to the free version of J. Brown Yoga Talks. To hear the rest of our conversation, please subscribe to Podcast Premium at jbrownyoga.com slash premium.